Happy Friday. Well, weekend plans? The what? Biochemistry. It doesn't get any better than that, right? How about a limerick for today? Today's limerick? From the folks who designed it and flew it, to the public all looking up to it, it seems out in space that Mars is a place where a thing called a rover runs through it. OK. Your laughter is polite, but thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're doing very well here, uh, staying on top of things. I've had numerous uh, interactions with uh, some of you. I'm very happy with that. I also posted last night office hours for the TAs. If you click on that link right there, it will take you to an ugly picture of me and the TAs. Okay, And so you can find their office hour information down below. OK. Um, now, um, I have one last thing I want to talk about with respect to buffers, and that will relate to what we're going to talk about today in amino acids. So I want to make sure I um, touch bases with you on that. Okay? So um, when we looked at, ac at acetic acid, very simple buffer, we noted that the buffering capacitor, this wasn't acetic acid, but it, acetic acid would look like this. But for any simple uh, a uh, weak acid that has one proton it can gain or lose. We said that within one pH unit of the pKa, plus or minus, that was the maximum buffering capacity. Okay? So for acetic acid, that was between about 3.76 and about 4.76. For this particular one here, it was between about 1.5 and about 3.5. Okay? And one of the things that you will find when we get working with proteins is it's useful to be able to estimate the charge on a molecule. All right? Well, the charge on a molecule varies. Right? If we have 50% of the molecules that has a proton on and 50% of the molecules that has a proton off, what's the charge of the molecule? Well, it depends on which one I'm talking about, right? The one that's got the proton on or the proton off, because they're going to differ by one. right? Well, if we get outside of that pH range, if we were to have this, this uh, weak acid, and I said to you, what is the charge of this molecule at pH 7? Well, that's quite a ways away from the pKa. Would you say that it would tend to have more protons off or more protons on? There's a good exam question. Because, and in fact, it would have most of, the most of its proton off. Most of them would have a proton off. If you do the math, and I'll show you how to do it if you don't know how to do it, but if you do the math, you'll see that that guy's going to have a, uh, about 100,000 to 1 protons off to protons on. Okay? So I give you a sort of a simple rule, and this is one I won't give you on an exam, so you should know this rule. A simple rule for estimating charge. And notice it's only for estimating charge. But a simple rule is if the pH of a solution is one or more units above the pKa, we can estimate that the proton is off. It's a good estimate. One or more units above the pKa, a good estimate is that the proton is off. And if we have a pH of a solution that's one or more units below the pKa, we can estimate that the proton is essentially on. Okay? Now, that's a rule. It's a good general rule of thumb. It's good for estimates. It's not a perfect rule, but it's a very good rule of estimates for protons off and on. Students say, well, what about in between the two? Well, in between the two, you could actually could calculate 50% and 50%, right? So you could say, well, 50% of them have a proton on, 50% of them have a proton off if the pH equals the pKa, right? But I'm not going to ask you to say, is that 3 quarters of a charge or half of a charge or something like that. We're only going to talk about full charges. So basically, a pH unit above or a pH unit below, right? That turns out to be really useful when we get to amino acids that have more than one pKa really useful estimate for us when we get to amino acids that have more than one pKa. Okay? The last thing I want to mention is just a definition of a term for you. 
and we'll talk about it more with amino acids, and that is a term we call the PI. PI. Okay. Now students say, well, what's the difference between a pKa and a pH? Well, a pKa is a specific pH, right? A PI is a specific pH also. PI turns out to be the specific pH where a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. PI is a pH in which a molecule has a charge of exactly zero. Now that'll turn out to be interesting and useful when we talk about amino acids and when we talk about proteins. But that's what the PI is. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention to amino acids. We're starting to talk about protein structure. And we started talking about protein structure at the very simplest level, that is the building blocks that make up the protein. Hopefully everybody learned basic biology and organic chemistry that the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. There are 20 amino acids that are most commonly found in proteins. There are a couple of oddball amino acids beyond the 20. And some of the 20 get modified. Okay? But for the most part, we're talking about 20 amino acids that make up proteins. Okay? Proteins are the most complicated structures you will find in a cell. In Dira, my wife and I were uh, sort of scoffing recently, there's a, there's a YouTube video out there, and there's a lot of crap on YouTube, probably including me, but there's a lot of crap on YouTube, right? And one of the crap things on YouTube told students that DNA is the most complicated structure inside of a cell. Just total bullshit, <laughs> okay? Proteins are easily the most complicated structure inside of cells, all right? And the reason that they're complicated is you got 20 possibilities at every site. Every single amino acid has 20 different possibilities. So when we look at a protein, we realize that there's a lot of diversity, a lot of complexity to proteins. Okay? We'll talk about proteins as having four levels of structure. Four levels of structure. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Not all of them will have all of those. All of them will have primary. All of them will have secondary. Okay? And then we'll talk about the others a little bit. Let's talk about first looking at, at what this is. Primary structure of a protein. So I'm going to lay out what these structures are for you just in terms of definitions, and then we're going to talk about them in some detail. The primary structure of a protein is the easiest one to understand. Okay? It is the sequence of amino acids making up that protein. So a protein might have a sequence where the first amino acid is methionine, the second amino acid is aspartic acid, the third amino acid is lysine, the fourth amino acid is leucine, doesn't really matter for our purposes here. That protein is going to be different from a protein that has a different sequence of those amino acids. And the reason is because each amino acid is chemically different than the other ones. So ultimately, and if there's one idea I want you to plant into your heads about proteins, ultimately, the sequence of the amino acids in a protein, that is, the protein's primary structure, the sequence of amino acids in a protein determines all of the other properties of the protein. Everything ultimately comes down to the sequence of amino acids. Okay? The amino acids are joined together by covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are the only bonds holding together primary structure. You remember from what I said about bonds to begin with, that covalent bonds are very strong. They're much stronger than hydrogen bonds. And that's important because we don't want the amino acids coming apart easily. If we want to use heat to break the peptide bonds, that is the bonds, the, the covalent bonds between amino acids, we have to go to something like 1,000 degrees centigrade. Right? It takes a lot of heat to break 
covalent bonds. Well, of course, proteins aren't encountering that in our bodies, hopefully. Real hothead, right? Okay. The secondary structure of a protein is a little bit more complicated. When we go from primary to secondary to tertiary quaternary, what we start talking about are interactions between amino acids that are farther and farther and farther away from each other. Primary, one amino acid to the next amino acid, that's a distance of one amino acid, right? There's no distance. You don't have, you can't say that a protein has a primary structure where the first amino acid is linked to the fifth amino acid. Because the first is linked to the second, the second is linked to the third, the third is linked to the fourth, and there's no jumping over that gap. Okay? The secondary structure relates to interactions between amino acids that are close, but not immediately next to each other. These will typically be interactions between amino acids. And notice I said typically. It's not an absolute thing. But typically between amino acids that are between 4 and 10 of each other in primary sequence. If I look at the primary sequence and I see two amino acids that are about 4 to 10 amino acids away from each other, if they're interacting, that can give rise to a type of secondary structure. Okay? Tertiary structure relates to interactions between amino acids that are farther apart than 10. Okay? So I might see amino acid number 16 interacting with amino acid number 238. And if I saw that, I would say, OK, that's part of a tertiary structure of a protein. As I say, I'll give you some examples of these as we go through and talk about them. Well, if tertiary is greater than 10, how can quaternary fit in? It turns out that quaternary structure relates to interactions between separate polypeptide chains. A polypeptide is one protein. Okay. So two polypeptide chains can interact. We will see that many proteins have what we call multiple subunits. Hemoglobin is one we'll talk about a lot. Hemoglobin has four subunits. And how those subunits interact with each other relates to what we call quaternary structure. OK, so that's the four levels of structure that we see. As I say, we'll go through in some detail about these. Before I talk too much about primary structure, though, I do, want, I do need to talk about the chemical properties of the individual amino acids that are in a protein. All right, first of all, you learned in organic chemistry that carbons that have four different things attached to them can have those four different things arranged in three-dimensional space in two different ways. Okay. Now, chemistry has a very elaborate scheme for how you identify which ones where. Biochemists are really lazy people. Okay? We're really lazy, and that's going to benefit you guys a lot. Okay? We're not going to go through those elaborate naming schemes. In fact, where we have opportunities to do elaborate naming schemes, we will usually appoint them. In the case of the two different ways to arrange the four groups around a carbon in an amino acid, we refer to them as the L isomer and the D isomer. I'll give you some other good news. You're not going to have to draw one. Okay? You're not going to have to draw, hey, Kevin, this is an L isomer. Hey, Kevin, this is a D isomer. But you should know that they exist. Okay? Now, it turns out that this is very important because if we look at the amino acids that are found in proteins, we discover a very, very interesting bias. Essentially, all of them are in the L configuration. Essentially, all of them are in the L configuration. How the L did that happen, right? <laughs> well, the way that that happened was proteins get put together in a three-dimensional 
array. They, there are enzymes, there are enzymes, the things called ribozymes that put together proteins, and they have specific three-dimensional configurations. They will only grab things that have the right three-dimensional configuration, and since these are different three-dimensional configurations, it turned out that if you grabbed an L, it could use an L. So this cell says, okay, I'm going to use an L, the primordial cell from which we all evolved. All right? And when it used that L, then all the progeny that came from that used an L. And so everything ultimately used L amino acids. Okay? That's where we are. Now, there are rare exceptions to that, and I'll talk about those later. They're kind of cool. They're not made, they're not put into proteins in the way that a protein is normally made. And they're done, actually, for defensive purposes by bacteria. We'll talk about those later. But if we throw those out, essentially everything else is in the L configuration. All right? Pretty cool stuff. Now, as we look at these schematic structures, there's some things I want you to know about them. Okay? This schematic structure basically describes, describes every amino acid. One minor exception to that, but for our, all pur practical purposes, this describes the way that amino acids have structure. All amino acids will have a central carbon like this called the alpha carbon. It's the alpha carbon that has the four different groups on it. There's one amino acid that only has three different groups on it. We'll see that in a bit. Okay. The alpha carbon has attached to it something called the alpha carboxyl. That's the acid part of the amino acid. All amino acids have attached to the alpha carbon also an alpha amino group. That's the amino part of the amino acid. So every single amino acid that's found in proteins has an alpha amino, an alpha carbon, and an alpha carboxyl. Okay? All amino acids that are found in proteins have a hydrogen. We don't call it the alpha hydrogen, we just call it the hydrogen. And they also have attached to them an R group. The R group, you remember from organic chemistry, is something that's a variable. And it's in the R group that all amino acids differ from each other. It's the R group that gives each amino acid its characteristic chemistry. Some R groups are very small. Some R groups are fairly large. Many R groups are uncharged. Some R groups are charged. Some are polar, and some are completely nonpolar. OK. Now, I tell you that because I'm going to group amino acids into several categories. And it invariably happens that once I group them into categories, somebody's going to say, well, this book does it differently. That book does it differently. OK? It doesn't really matter. We're going to use the designations I have here, recognize that different books will categorize things in different ways. We're going to use, in this class, the designation that I have on here. Now, you will not have to draw the structures of the 20 amino acids in this class. You will not have to draw the structures of the 20 amino acids in this class. But you should know the chemical properties of the R groups of these amino acids, and that's how they're categorized. They're categorized according to the chemistry of their R groups. The ones we will call aliphatics have relatively short side chains, and they look like this. Now, you're wondering, what do I mean by the chemistry? I'm going to tell you that in a bit. Okay? First, glycine is what people describe as the simplest amino acid. Glycine is the only amino acid that only has three different things attached to that carbon. Huh? Well, yeah. One's a carboxyl, the alpha carboxyl. One is the alpha amino, but the other two are the same thing. They're both a hydrogen. Glycine is the only one 
that doesn't have asymmetry. It doesn't exist in D and L isomers. It's the only one that's in that category. The R group of glycine, therefore, is a hydrogen. Okay. A very similar amino acid is alanine. Alanine has a methyl group instead of a hydrogen for its R group. Now, do I have to memorize that it has a methyl group? No, you don't. Okay. I think you should know that glycine is the simplest because it only has a hydrogen. That'll turn out to be important for a couple of other things later. Okay. Look at proline. Proline is another odd one. We have the odd ones popping up in the aliphatics. It's an odd one because its R group goes up, up, around, and reconnects with the alpha amine. It's the only one that does that. This guy's alpha amine is attached to its R group. Yes, you should know, proline has an, a, a ring R group, and that ring R group is attached to its alpha amine. You should know that. Now, that turns out to be really important because you see, this guy right here, this is a single bond between this carbon and this nitrogen. This is a single bond between this carbon and this methyl group. And in fact, every amino acid except proline has those single bonds. And what I hope you remember from organic chemistry is that single bonds can rotate. They can rotate. Rotation will turn out to be important as we'll talk about. This guy can't rotate because if it tries to rotate, it would actually break that bond. So proline is the least flexible amino acid. Proline is the least flexible amino acid. OK. Now, we see some other R groups. There's valine. There's leucine. You see they look very similar. They have relatively simple R groups. If we go into the next category, the hydrophobics, we see that they tend to have a little longer R groups, and they tend to be fairly nonpolar. Hydrophobic, I hope you recall from your organic chemistry again, parts of a molecule that don't like to interact with water. We talked about some examples the other day. The R groups of these amino acids do not like to interact with water. Now, you should know that the hydrophobics include these amino acids. You should know that the aliphatics included the earlier ones that I showed you. But I'm not going to say, how do you draw isoleucine? Understand? So the categories are important. Okay. Now, looking at these, just there's some interesting things. Okay. Here's phenylalanine. Phenylalanine's got a benzene ring there. That's a pretty good sized R group compared to a methyl group. Tryptophan, look at the size of that one. That's actually the biggest R group. And when we start putting amino acids together, we're going to see that those big, bulky R groups place some constraints on the shape of the protein that contained them. They place some constraints on the shape of the protein that contained them. Methionine is the other one I'll mention here. Methionine is one of two amino acids that contains sulfur. Methionine is very unreactive. Its sulfur is very unreactive. The other amino acid that contains sulfur we'll talk about in a minute. It's called cysteine. And it's a fairly reactive sulfur. So methionine sulfur is not very reactive. It just sits there. And that's because it's attached to two carbons. We'll see that in the case of cysteine, the sulfur is attached on one side by up to a hydrogen, and that's the reactive part. OK. Here are the polar amino acids. They're polar because they have a portion of them that makes very good hydrogen bonds with water. And when I talk about a portion of them, I'm talking about a portion of their R group. All amino acids have portions of them that interact with water because they all have an alpha carboxyl and they all have an alpha amine. But these amino acids have an R group 
that has a portion of them that interacts with water by hydrogen bonds. Okay. Two of these contain, um, uh, actually three of them contain hydroxyl groups, serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And an OH makes very nice hydrogen bonds with water. The next two have uh, an amide bond, and you can see that is a carboxamide bond, which is shown right here. And this bond up here, this makes very nice hydrogen bonds with water also. Okay. The last of these is cysteine. Cysteine is a little hard to categorize. We can put cysteine in this category. We can also put cysteine in the category of a group that ionizes, because as we will see, the hydrogen that's on that sulfur comes off pretty readily. Okay. But in terms of categorizing, we're just categorizing this as polar. Right? But just remember that cysteine can ionize fairly readily. OK, I'll talk more about cysteine in just a bit. The next category are those that have R groups that ionize very readily under physiological pH. They have R groups that ionize readily under physiological pH. Okay. These guys are amino acids that contain in their R group, where am I at here? That wasn't what I wanted. Oh, I didn't put it on. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong link here for you. Uh, well, here's the category, so I'll, I'll, I'll dig up the right link for you. The category includes lysine, arginine, and histidine. And all of these three amino acids contain in their R group an amine. That amine readily ac accepts protons and ionizes. It becomes charged as a result of that. That's why I call it the positive R groups. Many books will call them the basic amino acids, but we're avoiding that term unless we're talking about a strong base. So I call them the, po the, the positive R group amino acids. And that's, I'll remind you, under physiological pH, physiological pH roughly 7 to 8, they will be charged. Okay. The last category are the ones that are the negatively charged R groups. Some books call them the acidic amino acids because their R group contains a carboxyl. There's the carboxyl of aspartic acid. There's the carboxyl of glutamic acid. You'll see that the only difference between aspartic acid and glutamic acid is in the R group where there's an extra carbon in glutamic acid compared to aspartic acid. At physiological pH, these guys will tend to be negatively charged. At physiological pH, these will tend to be negatively charged. Now, when I talked earlier about the chemistry and I said you should know the chemistry of the R groups, especially for the ones that ionize, you need to know how they ionize. I'm not asking you to draw the structure, but you should know if I say aspartic acid, you should know that aspartic acid has an ionizing R group. You should know that aspartic acid has a negative charge when it loses its proton. And you should know that it has a zero charge when it has its proton. That's what a carboxy carboxylic acid has. The same is true of glutamic acid. The same is true of the three positively charged amino acids that I talked about. Lysine, when it accepts a proton, has a positive charge. When it loses its proton, it has a zero charge. Notice that there's not one simple rule. You need to know those. You, so if I say lysine, you're going to need to think, OK, lysine can be a plus one or a zero, whether it has a proton on or a proton off. The only exception I'm going to add to these is cysteine. I told you cysteine was a little odd, a little hard to place. Cysteine can lose a proton off of its sulfur. If it loses its proton, it has a negative charge. If it has its proton, it has a zero charge. 
That's the chemistry I'm talking about when I'm saying you need to know the chemistry of the side chains. Everybody with me? Yes? Can the carboxyl group and the R group attach to the, um, to the alpha carboxyl, is that what you're saying? Yeah. In some cases, it actually can if the amino acid is free. For our purposes that we'll talk about in class, the amino acids are almost always going to be within proteins. And this alpha uh, carboxyl and this alpha amine will not be free. So that won't happen. But there are places where that can happen, yes? This guy right here? Just the way it was drawn? Just the way it was drawn. We will talk about the resonance in just a minute. Okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Sure. So cysteine is the one I'm adding to the ionizable group, the ionizable R. So, that so far I've talked about the positively charged ones. There were three of them. The negatively charged ones, there were two of them. Those are what we call the ionizable R groups. The other ionizable R group we're adding to that is cysteine. Cysteine can lose a proton off of its sulfur. If it loses the proton, it has a negative charge. If it has the proton on, it has a zero charge. OK? Other questions? Everybody's totally going, god dang. All right. So those are the properties of the amino acids. Now, this table kind of summarizes things. And in fact, this table goes a little further than I do because it shows how tyrosine, for example, can ionize. And we're going to treat tyrosine as if it really doesn't ionize. Okay? That keeps your life simple, right? We're going to treat it like it doesn't. Now, what does this show us? It shows us the acid form, which it, what it calls the acid form. This is not my table, by the way. The acid form is simply being the form that has the proton. And the form that they call the base that we would call what? The salt, which has lost the proton. This table's a little wonky because on the same page of Stryer that this comes from, it gives different values for the pKa's compared to what's actually right here. So it, don't read too much into that. Look at what's happening in each case. If I said to you that something had a high pKa, what did that mean about its strength as an acid? It was a weak acid, right? A very weak, weak acid. The one that has the most, the highest pKa here is arginine. Arginine is the weakest of the weak acids, meaning what? Well, it means that it really doesn't like to give up this proton in this direction. It only gives up this proton if we get around or above pH 12.5. A strong weak acid gives up its proton much more readily up here. Now by thinking about this in terms of weak acids and salts, we don't have to think about does it accept or not accept. We only think about it donating. It becomes very simple. Okay? All right. Now, I have some videos online that I show you the ionization of amino acids. You might find those helpful. I'm not going to go into them here. I also show on those videos how proteins that contain those amino acids are charged. And for those, both of those, the amino acids and the proteins, that rule I gave you about estimating charge, you can use. The pH is more than one unit above the pKa for a group proton is off, the pH is more than one, one or more units below the pKa, the proton is on. Okay? So look through those. You'll probably have questions, and that's fine. If you have questions, see the TAs, see me. We'll be happy to help you through that. And the videos also, hopefully, should help you with those. OK. Abbreviations, blah, blah. OK. All right. You do not have to know any abbreviations of any amino acid. I'm not going to ask you an abbreviation. All right? If you want to memorize them, if you want to use them, you can use them. But you are not expected to learn them. All they are are memorizing things. And who cares about memorizing that which amino acid has which one letter code? 
You don't learn anything more by doing that. So we're not going to care about the abbreviations. When I give you problems on an exam, I'll write out the full name. OK? All right. OK, now let's look at an ionization of an amino acid. Okay. I picked a tough one, aspartic acid. I picked an amino acid that has an R group that will ionize, as an example. Let's take a look at that. I said if we had two groups that could ionize, we would see a flattening of the curve in two places. I picked one that has three, and you see they kind of flatten out. But there's one, there's two, there's three. I want to just step you through this so you understand that. Okay. Students make a mistake when they associate pKa values. And by the way, pK1 refers to pKa1, pKa2, and pKa3. They make a mistake when they connect a pKa value to a molecular structure. pKa values are not connected to a specific molecular structure. They will always be connected to a pair of molecular structures. Notice, if I have aspartic acid with all the protons on, and when I say all the protons on, it means every group that can have a proton on it has its proton on it. Aspartic acid has three groups, a carboxyl up here at the top. And you can see that it has a proton on. It has an R group down here, has its proton on. And in both cases, the charges are 0 when the proton is on. And it has an alpha amine that has a proton on. And when the alpha amine has a proton on, it has a positive charge. This guy here has an overall charge of plus 1. When it ionizes, which group is going to ionize? Well, the one that is the strongest acid. The, the one that has the lowest pKa will be the strongest acid. It will be the first one to ionize. And it turns out that the alpha amino group typically is the first one because the alpha amino group's pKa is roughly about 2.2. And yes, I will give you that on an exam. Okay. Notice that what's happening. This pKa is associated with this and this. It's not associated with just this. It refers to the ionization that is the two forms that are present right here. This second pKa is associated with these two forms. The third pKa is associated with these two forms. And in each case, you'll see that the forms are differing by one proton. This first proton is coming off here on the alpha carboxyl. The second proton comes off on the R carboxyl. And the third proton comes off on the alpha amine. If I had an amino acid that had an R group that had an amine, it might be a different order. How would I determine? By the pKa values. So don't get in the habit of memorizing this is the way it happens. Use the pKa values to tell you. Okay. Let's look at this guy. All right. We see a rise. We see a flattening. And when we see that flattening, we know that flattening is referring to the fact that we have buffer going on. It rises again. And it doesn't get a chance to rise too much because the second pKa value is relatively close. And we see a flattening again. It rises. And we see a third flattening. Now, notice that the pi is labeled on here. The pi, you remember I said, was a special pH. It was the pH value at which the molecule had a charge of exactly 0. Let me tell you something. pi must be calculated. Because I define pKa as the precise pH where a molecule had a charge of exactly 0. We can't use the estimating rule to determine pi. We can't use the estimating rule about pH being above or below to do that. Okay? We have to calculate. Well, how in the hay do we calculate the pi? I'll tell you a way, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you the way to do it right, and then I'll tell you the way you're going to do it, the way you shouldn't do it, okay? the way you're going to want to do it. You're going to look at this and say, oh, well, the pi is very simple. If you took the pKa1, and you took the pKa2, 
and you average those two, you would get the PI. And you would be exactly right in this case. You would be exactly right in this case. How did I know that? Well, let's look at this. What's the charge on this guy on the left? Plus one. What's the charge on this guy right here? Zero. And what's the charge on this guy over here? Minus one. Now, if you want to associate pKa values with a single molecule, what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, well, it's got a charge of zero. Uh, which pKa value do I pick? You've made the mistake already of saying a pKa value is associated with a molecule. It's not. Right? All right. If we look at this graph, we say, here's the flattening for pKa2. Here's the flattening for pKa1. And right in the middle, this is where this molecule will exist. Right in the middle. Right in the middle will be the average of the two pKa's on either side of it. That's why in this case, pKa1 and pKa2, the average of those gives me the pI. Some amino acids we're going to see have pIs over here. How will you decide that? Well, if you do it the right way, you'll always get it right. The right way is to do exactly what's been done here. Charge of plus 1, charge of 0, charge of minus 1, charge of minus 2. Where's the 1 that is 0? Average the two pKa's around it. Bingo. If you decide, oh, he said something about averaging pKa's. Maybe if I just took pKa1 and pKa2 and pKa3 and average them, I'll get it. You won't. Okay? That's the two most common things that people do. Now, the beauty of this is with this graph, I can look at here, and the way I've drawn it, I can actually see which form predominates at certain pHs. That zero form was predominating about right here. Okay? How did I know that? Well, all protons on below the P first pKa, one proton off above the first pKa, two protons off above the second pKa, three protons off above the third pKa. Okay? These graphs tell you something. When I talk about practical chemistry, again, I come back to that term. I want you understanding meaning. What do these things mean? And not, how did I do it last time? Because how did I do it last time is going to get you in trouble. But meaning will always get you what you're after. OK? Now, try doing the same thing for lysine, just as an example. I'm not going to do it here. But you try it. You look and see what you get for lysine and see if it makes any sense. OK? I think if you apply what I've described to you here, you'll get the right answer. If you want to come see me about that, I'll be happy to meet with you. OK? Try lysine. OK, questions about that? Yes, back there. Say it again. So the question is, does the, the charge with the form zero actually exist? Certainly. All right, the question is, is, is more one, does 100% of all of them have the charge of exactly zero? That's more of what your question's about. Okay? For all practical purposes, 95% uh, or more will have that charge. Okay? And on average, everything will average out to zero at that point, which is why we calculate that precise point. Okay? Okay. All right, I'm going to start for about two or three minutes talking about protein structure, what we'll talk about next time. We've now gotten amino acid structure under our belts. I want to say a little bit about how we put them together and what we get. Okay? I trust everybody learned the basic biology that proteins are made in ribosomes. And ribosomes use the genetic code to link amino acids together in the right order according to what the genetic code specifies. We'll talk about that next term, but you should know that basic idea. The reaction that's occurring inside the ribosome is what you see on the screen. The alpha amine of one, of one amino acid is being joined to the alpha carboxyl of another. 
these two guys are joining, and we are creating a new bond that we call a peptide bond. Notice that in the process, water is split out. And this reaction is reversible. We can make this reaction go backwards. One of the ways that we, we can treat proteins in laboratories, we can hydrolyze them, meaning we can actually break the bonds between them if we treat them properly. For all intents and purposes, once that bond has been made, it's pretty stable. But we can break them apart. Okay? The peptide bond, therefore, is that covalent bond that I mentioned earlier that is joining together adjacent amino acids. I want you to notice that in the making of that peptide bond, we actually changed the chemistry of both of those amino acids. And we changed it fairly significantly. We had a, a free alpha amine earlier. We had a free alpha carboxyl earlier. And after we had the peptide bond, that free alpha carboxyl on the left amino acid disappeared. And the free alpha amine on the right amino acid also disappeared. They are no longer free. They're joined in a peptide bond. And because they're joined in a peptide bond, you're going to like this part, they can't ionize. They cannot ionize once they have formed a peptide bond. That turns out to be a great simplification for estimating the charge of a protein. They cannot ionize. Well, let's look at this. Let's imagine, first of all, that the R1 group here is an amino acid that can't ionize. And we imagine that the R2 also can't ionize. Let's compare what we started with to what we have. We started with something that can ionize here. In fact, it already is ionized here. That is, the alpha amine was ionized. We had the alpha carboxyl ionized. On the other amino acid, we had exactly the same two. We had four things that could ionize. Right? After we made the peptide bond, we have one alpha amine left, and we have one alpha carboxyl left. Only two things can ionize. If I were to say to you, I've got a protein that is, well, let's just make it simple, three amino acids long, how many groups would ionize if the R groups couldn't ionize? couldn't ionize? Only two. So every time we do this, we're, we're, we're making something that's actually fairly simple. We only have an alpha amine, and we have an alpha carboxyl. If I wanted to determine the charge of a protein, how would I determine it? I would simply have to determine the charge on one alpha amine, one alpha carboxyl, and any R groups that ionize. That's simple. That's very, very simple. And yes, you will have to do that. Okay, But we've just simplified that process significantly. OK. That's about time for a song. What do you guys think? Yeah. All right. Today, I have someone who's going to sing the song, who can sing it much better than I can. This is somebody who took my class many years ago. He actually has a career as a professional singer. His name is David Simmons. He's in. He just graduated from medical school, and he's going to sing a song called The Amino Alphabet. I thought. Oh. You can sing along. What's going on, man? The what? Oh, that's a stupid thing. OK. Yes. Oh, that's off up there. OK, thank you. Here we go. You can sing along. Lysine arginine and yes, basic ones you should not miss. Alleluia, I am that. Billy. Cis has S. Glycines are is the smallest. 
And there's turf and tire and feed, structured aromatically. Aspen glue side chains of R, say to protons au revoir. Glutamine asparagine, bare carboxamide amines, three amine and tiny ser, have hydroxyl groups to share. These twenty amino A's can combine a zillion. Okay, have fun this weekend, guys.